one of these trees is the sun. And you can see that the tree, the, the smaller tree, the younger tree has grown in the shadow of the great tree. Hey guys, I'm Harmony Klingenmeyer and welcome to Hope Arises. This show exists to inspire and empower you to obey the voice of God. God is calling his children to hear his voice in this season and to boldly follow him, putting our hands in his hands, no matter the cost, so that we will see our hearts and our homes and our generations transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Today, I want to start Hope Arises with a little bit of Bible trivia and the chance to win my book, Hear Their Voices, A Portrait of an American Foster Family. The Bible trivia question today is, how many people did Jesus raise from the dead? How many people did Jesus raise from the dead? This is not a trick question. It's just a straight number. And I would love for you to email your answer to hclings29 at heartheirvoices.net. The first email I receive, uh, I will be sending out a signed copy of my book with a word of encouragement written in the cover. Today is a special day because I am gonna be talking about one of my very favorite characters from the scripture, someone who's story inspires me uh, to fully embrace who God called me to be. When I look at this character, I see myself, really. Uh, and you know what? It's, it's a man, too. So there's a part of my brain as a woman of God that says, oh, I can only associate with female characters in the scripture, but I've decided that's not true. You know, Paul said in, in Galatians, in Christ there is neither male nor female neither Jew nor Greek, neither bond nor free, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. And so when I look at this character, I literally see myself. I see the person that God created me to be. I see the nature and character of Christ demonstrated through this man's life um, that I see when I look in the mirror. And this person is um, the man called Barnabas. You know, Barnabas is actually a really pivotal and powerful character from scripture. And he doesn't get a lot of attention because, you know, he didn't write any books of the Bible. But the truth is, if it wasn't for Barnabas, we wouldn't have three quarters of the New Testament. Barnabas did something incredible. He believed in another man's calling. He poured himself into another person in order to, in order to see that person step into the call of God in their life, in order to see that person succeed in the things of God, in order to see that person fully actualized, he laid down his own ambitions. He gave up position, power, probably influence, speaking engagements, speaking opportunities, so that another person could step into that role. He took a back seat uh, so that a really important Bible character could do the call of God in his life. And, and that man's name um, was Paul. So today, um, I wanna start this, this little teaching um, by telling a story about uh, a prophet who actually lived in the 400 years between uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament. There were actually 400 years between the book of Malachi and the first chapter of Matthew. And the interesting thing about these 400 years is that it was a really silent time. They actually call those 400 years the silent years because there was no scripture being written. And the people of God were really waiting upon the messianic promise. And it's so interesting because at the end of Malachi, and you know what? I'm gonna just follow the leading of the Holy Spirit at this moment and go to Malachi. Malachi is the last book in the Old Testament and I'd love for you to join me there. I've got my Bible. I hope you guys do too. I don't know about you guys, but the scripture 
is bread that I eat every day. It's, it's uh, the, the bread that sustains my spirit. I love it. I love it. Even though we don't worship the Bible, God released his word to us in order to release life to us. So I love the scripture. So if we look at Malachi chapter 4, it's a rather short chapter. It only has six verses. But we're actually going to start in verse 5. Look, I am sending you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord arrives. His preaching will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. Otherwise, I will come and strike the land with a curse. Wow. It's so powerful. I, I, whenever I read this scripture, I get a picture of Malachi sitting with his disciples. As all the, the prophets had, they had um, people who would come and hear them teach and who followed their teachings. Um, and I get this picture in my mind of them sitting around maybe a, a cook fire and Malachi is prophesying. Malachi is sharing the heart of God. And of course we, we have these condensed down uh, uh, portions of his words. I'm sure he had lots and lots of teachings. But uh, this powerful verse, can you imagine the people listening to it? See it from their perspective. They, when they heard these verses, they must have thought to, to themselves, this is a messianic prophecy. This must mean that Messiah is about to come. And isn't it interesting that, that you know they had no way of knowing that uh, it would be another 400 years before Christ would appear. And yet he releases this word of great hope. And that's the, the intriguing thing to me really is um, how much hope how much hope hmm. the Word of God contains. The prophetic Word of God contains so much hope. Wow. So in these 400 years, there was actually a prophet who lived. His name was Honi. And he was a mighty prayer warrior and intercessor. And I can also imagine, now these are just the imaginings of Harmony, um, that he took the prophecies, the messianic prophecies of the Old Testament, of the, of the Old Covenant scriptures, and would declare them and prophesy them as he would pray. And there's a, there's a powerful story about, um, uh, about his life. And this story is uh, just a very simple one. He was walking down the road one day, and he saw a man out in a field uh, planting a specific kind of tree. I'm actually going to pull it up here and, and look and see what the name of this tree was. Mm, let's see. It was a carob tree. It was a carob tree. And the thing about carob trees is that they take a very long year, a long time, many years to come to maturity and produce fruit. And you know, we know that if, you, um, if you're a health food fanatic, you might actually buy carob chips instead of chocolate chips because some people, I, I don't agree in the slightest, but some people believe that carob tastes like chocolate. I don't think it does, but that's just my opinion. So it takes 70 years for these trees to come to, to maturity and to produce fruits. So the Honey, the, the prophet, turns to the man planting the carob trees and he asks him, how long will it take for the trees that you're planting right now to bear fruit? And the man responded, 70 years. Honey asked the man, and do you think you will live another 70 years and eat the fruit of this tree? Wow, good question. The man answered, perhaps not. However, when I was born into this world, I found many carob trees planted by my father and grandfather, just as they planted trees for me. I am planting trees for my children and grandchildren, so they will be able to eat the fruit of these trees. That is the heart of Barnabas. And I don't know if he was fully aware of what his loving father heart would produce in the lives 
of billions of believers who are yet to be born. But the truth is, he sowed himself into Paul's life before he was even called Paul in order to plant trees for a generation that had not been born yet. Let's turn to Acts chapter 4, verse 33. And we will look at the life and legacy of Barnabas. All right. I love using my paper Bible. I could, I could pull these verses much faster in on my electric Bible, but there's just something about that hard cover or soft leather cover Bible. Verse 33 says, The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's great blessing was upon them all. There were no needy people among them because those who owned land or houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles to give to those in need. For instance, there was Joseph, one of the apostles, the one the apostles nicknamed Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He was from the tribe of, Le of Levi and came from the island of Cyprus. He sold a field he owned and brought the money to the apostles. Wow, let's stop right there. What a powerful passage. You know, the Levites were a really special tribe in Israel. And I think it's important, this is an important piece of information to pass on to you. The Levites did not, were not given large tracts of ancestral land. Uh, the other tribes all received land when Joshua brought the people of Israel into the promised land. Uh, Reuben and the half-tribe of Manasseh, they had land um, outside of the, the actual promised land portion on the east side of the Jordan River. I don't know if you knew that, but actually some of the tribes of Israel lived on the east side of the Jordan River, but the vast majority of the Israelite tribes were to receive uh, a tract of land inside this, um, the piece, this land called the Promised Land on the west side of the Jordan, except for the Levites. The Levites were given cities, but they weren't given large um, acreages of land. And the reason is because God was the inheritance of the Levites. The Levites were the ones who served in the temple. They were the worship leaders and, and the, the, the prayer leaders and, and they were the ones, if you belong to the household of Aaron, they were the ones who offered sacrifice on behalf of the children of Israel. God God and his presence were, were their inheritance. So, uh, b however, that, that being said, uh, each family each within the Levite tribe was given a, a small plot of land uh, upon which to grow crops. Of course, they had to feed themselves. They were a, um, a farming community. They, were, um, they worked the land. And in order to feed their families, uh, they had to raise their own vegetables and, and crops. And so uh, they were given small pieces of land uh, to grow their vegetables and they were given cities. Well, these pieces of land were very small and they were passed down from father to son, generation after generation after generation. And you can imagine that this piece of land had been in Joseph's family because his name was Joseph before it was changed to Barnabas for perhaps a thousand years or more. This piece of land was part of his identity as a member of the Levite tribe. And yet what do we see Barnabas doing? We see him selling his ancestral land in order to feed the poor and the hungry in order to ensure that there would be no poor and hungry among the believers. Wow. I mean, we just stop and talk about that. 
Joseph, who became Barnabas, made an exchange, one identity, one sense of belonging for another. He said, I now have been transferred, transferred from the kingdom of Israel to, to the kingdom of the son of his love. Just as the scripture says, we have been transferred from one kingdom to another, from one family to another. And Barnabas no longer found his identity within um, his, the knowledge that he belonged to the Levitical priesthood. Instead, he found his identity in his, um, in his belonging to Jesus, in his belonging to the Messiah. And, and as an extension of the Messiah, his belonging to the, ch to the church, to, to God's family, uh, to the children of God. And in, in response, in response to his generous gift, we see the apostles uh, releasing a prophetic declaration over Barnabas' life, and that is to give him a new name to go along with his new identity of belonging to the Messiah. They change his name from Joseph to Barnabas, and the name Barnabas is such a powerful, powerful prophetic declaration of identity. This word is actually a marriage of two words. And the first one is son, bar. And we can actually hear it, right? We say when a, when a boy, a Jewish boy turns 13, he celebrates his bar mitzvah. That word bar means son. And the last half of his name is actually the Hebrew word for encouragement. But you know what, in the Greek, if you look at the name Barnabas in the Greek, and you look at this word for encouragement, you actually uh, find, you discover when you study the original language, that the word for encouragement in the Greek is parakletos. And we know, those of us who, s who study the original language, this word means comforter, encourager, advocate. And it's also a name for the person of the Holy Spirit. The, the apostles have totally reworked, totally rebirthed the identity of Barnabas in this moment. They're saying, you are now a son of the Holy Spirit. You are now a son of the advocate. And the interesting thing that is that this word parakletos or paraklesis is actually a legal term. It means the one who presents evidence on behalf of another person. Evidence that is accepted in the courts of the Lord. Isn't that powerful? And we, we know a little bit about Barnabas. We know a little bit about what's coming in the story. Can you see how the apostles prophesied over Barnabas' life the identity that he, that he would then go on to walk in? His name carried with it who he was meant to be. Wow, how powerful are our words? How powerful are our words? We could just stop right there and meditate on that truth for a minute. We are called, anointed, to create worlds with our words, just as our daddy God did. Oh, that's powerful. That is powerful. Well, we're going to go forward in the book of Acts, and we're going to look a little bit more about how Barnabas walked out his name, the prophetic identity that had been released over him by his spiritual fathers. You know, that's another thing to remember about Barnabas. Barnabas did not happen in a vacuum. Barnabas happened in community. He was planted and rooted inside of God-birthed community. God intends that for all of us. He actually intended for our families, our moms and our dads, to be the one to declare over us prophetic destiny. But many of us have not experienced that at home. Some have. I know I myself was prophesied over by my family members, which is, was an incredible gift. 
but many people do not experience that kind of power at home. And they're looking and hungering for the exact same experience that Barnabas had when he was renamed and claimed by the apostles as his spiritual fathers. So we're gonna jump forward in the book of Acts to uh, chapter nine. And we're gonna catch up with Barnabas. We're gonna start in verse 26. Now just a little bit of backstory here. We're about to jump into the middle of Saul's testimony. Saul was the one who persecuted the church. For those of you who are just new to the scripture, Saul was actually a Pharisee who, um, who consented to the, to the uh, imprisonment and murder of the first century church. And he had been sent to Damascus with permission from the Sanhedrin to imprison and execute Christians. But on his way, he encountered the living Christ and he was uh, he, thrown from his donkey as the light of Christ shone all around him. And Jesus spoke to him and said, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And you know what? That was the moment of Saul's conversion. Saul was struck blind in that moment as the light of Christ hit his eyes. But a few days later, a man named Ananias came, laid his hands on Saul, and the scales fell from his eyes. From that moment on, Saul went into the streets and began to preach the gospel. But the truth is, the church didn't want anything to do with Saul. He was the man who had consented to the stoning of Stephen. He held other men's coats while they stoned an innocent man. They wanted nothing to do with him. They didn't trust him. They didn't feel safe with him. And you know what? Saul had something to prove. He had something to prove to the church and um, they weren't quite ready to give him that opportunity. Enter Barnabas. Thank you so much for joining us today for Hope Arises. It is such a pleasure and a privilege to be with you, studying the Word of God together, growing in our faith, growing in our understanding of God's Word together. I love our Hope Arises community and I'm so excited to connect with you more. Please feel free to go to my website, heartheirvoices.net, where you can read my blog, you can order my book, Hear Their Voices, A Portrait of an American Foster Family, and connect with us more on YouTube with videos and other sermons. I look forward to seeing you guys next week on Tuesday, where we will continue studying Barnabas and his legacy, his impact on the life of the Apostle Paul. Be blessed.